All right, let's pray together. Father, I thank you and I praise you for all that are here. I thank you for your presence. I thank you for the way that you've already chosen to minister and minister to hearts. I thank you that, Lord, you do make a way where there seems not to be a way. I do thank you, Lord, that you are a great promise keeper and you're a miracle worker. There's nothing beyond your reach and nothing that you cannot do. I pray, God, that you would help me that you would anoint me afresh with your Holy Spirit, that you would, by your Spirit, illuminate your word. I pray, God, that we might have understanding, that we might have focus, that we might give our attention to the things that we ought to give our attention to today. And, Lord, that we would leave here stronger and better equipped than when we came in. In Jesus' name, amen. When I was a, when I was a kid, I had my fair share of childhood experiences that would be a little bit anxiety producing or fear producing just stuff you know when you're a little child five six years old afraid of the dark you know a bad storm I remember being down the shore walking out and getting a little further than what I anticipated getting you know and then it starts getting high and the waves are going there was always one thing though that would make it all go away Whenever my dad came around, whatever I was afraid of, I was no longer afraid of. Whatever I was anxious about, I was no longer anxious about. And whatever it was, I was kind of sweating out there when I was in the water. When he was right there with me, it was absolutely gone. One of the most compelling truths that comes out of the Christmas story, in fact, what I think is perhaps the greatest promise in the Bible is God is with us or God with us with us. Emmanuel, God with us. If, if God's, well, you know what? God's with you, you're never going to be alone. If God's with you, you never have to fear. If God's with you, you never have to be anxious. I'm not saying you won't be. I'm just saying you don't have to be. If God, God's with you, you're never going to be overmatched. There's nothing going to be too much for you. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk, Matthew chapter 1, if you have your Bibles, go to Matthew chapter 1. We're going to talk about God, and we're going to talk about what, what it means for Him to be with you or with us. Matthew chapter 1, this is the birth of Jesus, verse 28. Matthew 1, verse 28. It says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, betrothal is a legal arrangement. It's like engagement, but it's stronger than engagement. And the only way, if you were betrothed to a woman, woman to a man, the only way you could break that was through divorce. So Mary was betrothed to Joseph. Before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband, Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. What's obvious and apparent here is Joseph did not believe Mary's story. Mary was a young girl. She was betrothed to Joseph. He was going to marry her, and she turns out to be pregnant. I'm assuming she told Joseph, I have to worry about this. I didn't run around on you. You know, an angel of the Lord came to me and told me this is, this is from the Holy Spirit. He obviously didn't believe her. Okay, and but he was a kind man. I'm sure he was hurting. I'm sure he was offended, but uh, he didn't believe her. So her husband Joseph, being a just man and un- unwilling to put her to shame, in other words, he didn't want to draw any unnecessary attention and shame her any more than would already be the case. Resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, and just as an aside, he considered these things, what he did is he didn't act immediately, actually. He didn't act in an instant. He didn't act just reactively. There, there's at least a, a little bit of time. Might not have been, it may have only been hours, who knows. But he thought and he considered um, the situation and what he was going to do. It says, as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. What was necessary for Joseph to change direction here was something supernatural. He needed an angel to appear to him in a dream. And the angel said, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. The name Jesus is the Greek equivalent of a Hebrew name, Joshua or Joshua. It simply means Jehovah saves or Jehovah is salvation or Jehovah is my salvation. She'll bear a son. You shall call his name Jesus. He will save his people from their sins. This presupposes and assumes that 
uh, actually for all of us, that we are sinners, that we are in need of a Savior, and that we cannot save ourselves. There is no self-salvation. Scripture goes on. It says, All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. This is the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son. They shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Jesus is his proper name. Emmanuel is a title that describes him. God with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took his wife, but he knew her not until she had given birth to his son, and he called his name Jesus. So we're going to talk about uh, who is this God that's with us, and how is it that he's with us? If we were to go to the Gospel of John, and you can go there if you like, if we were to go to the Gospel of John, it kind of provides a little bit of elaboration on, on this, what we're talking about, God with us, because this is an amazing thing. You mean God is with us? First of all, we've got to talk about who this God is, and I'm actually going to talk about this in two different kind of phases as I unpack the message here this morning. Who is this God? Well, in John chapter 1, the Bible says this, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So the God that's with us, in fact, then it says, And the Word became flesh and tabernacled among us, or pitched his tent among us, or lived among us, or dwelled among us, the Word is the one that took on flesh and dwelt among us. That's how God is with us. That's called the Incarnation. But backing up for a minute, in the beginning was the Word. The verb there, was, indicates timeless existence. Whenever the beginning began, the Word already was because there was never a time when the Word didn't exist. And see, the Word who became flesh is, in fact, Christ himself. The Word is the second person of the Trinity. It says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. God, and the Word was God. Uh, it, it's, a, it's amazing. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. That indicates that preposition there, with, Greek is pros. It means two or towards. It means face to face. It means the Word, Jesus. It means the Word, the Son, existed face to face with, with God, but He was in fact God. So there is this incredible unity but there's also a distinction that's made here. So what we know is this, is that there is one God, there's three distinct persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And then the scripture goes on, because what we're talking about is God with us, and we, we need to know something about this God who is with us. It says, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then the Bible says this, and all things were made through Him. The God who always was, the God who was the Word, and the God who became flesh is the one that has made everything. And there's nothing that's been made except what He has made. In fact, in Colossians, speaking about Christ, it says all things were created by Him, for Him, through Him, and all things hold together, and for Him, and all things hold together in Him. And it says that He took on flesh. So... What God did is he became something that he had never been before without ceasing to be who he always was. He always was God, but then in history, he became man without ceasing to be God. And the reason, well, there's a number of reasons that he did that. The reasons that he did that, or the central reason I might say that he did that, is because, remember, the baby, his name is going to be Jesus because he'll save his people from their sins. He did this in order to save us from our sins. The mission of God. In fact, how about this? God invaded this dark world in the person of Christ in order to rescue us for, from our sins. Jesus' mission is detailed in Luke 19.10. He came to seek and to save the loss. That's why he came. So you're saying, so, okay, but he took on human flesh. Why didn't he do that? Why didn't he just like speak a word from heaven? Well, the Bible, te well, the Bible teaches a couple things. The Bible teaches that he took on human flesh so that he would know experientially what it's like to be part of the human community. Uh, the Bible teaches that he took on human flesh. You can see this in Hebrews chapter 2. So that he'd be able to sympathize with us. He'd be a high priest that could sympathize with us experientially regarding the challenges of being a human being. But for me, most importantly, he took on human flesh is because he had to be a man in order to atone for my sins. He also had to be God. But the reason he had to be a man is because justice demanded that the one who did the offense 
pay the price for the offense, and the one who had done the offense, we'll put it this way, was humanity. So humanity had to be the one that paid the price for it. I mean, fundamentally, that's just to be the, the case. And it had to be fully holy, fully righteous humanity, which is only Christ. And then had to be God because it had to be fully God. Why did he have to be fully God? Because the infinite God was going to exercise infinite wrath because of the sins of man, and only an infinite God could satisfy that infinite wrath. There just simply was no way, other way to do it. An infinitely holy God had, be sinned, had been sinned against, and it required an infinitely holy God, man, to satisfy that, the God-man. So we, we have that. He came, so listen, you guys that are here, you're not a Christian this morning, and you know you're not a Christian. What you need to do is you need to call out to Jesus. It says that all that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Don't think you're a Christian just because you're sitting in church this morning. Don't think you're a Christian because you go to church regularly. Don't think you're a Christian even though you, vo you might volunteer and do work here right in, in our church here. Don't think you're a Christian just because you know all the terminology. Don't think you're a Christian just because you got baptized. Don't think you're a Christian because mom and dad were, were, were Christians. Don't, think, don't, don't deceive yourself and don't buy into that. You're a Christian. You're a Christ follower if you have repented of your sins and placed your faith in Jesus as Savior and Lord. So when we read the Christmas story, and it says Jesus came to save his people from their sins. When we read in Luke 19, and Jesus said, I came to seek and save the lost, he's not talking about some kind of abstract people out here or out there. He's talking about you and me. So if you confess your sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So anyhow, we have this, this, this amazing truth, God with us. How is God with us? God is with us in the person of Christ in what's called the incarnation. But how many of you know that Jesus is not physically present with us anymore? I mean, we all know that, right? He's not physically present. He lived a life. He, was, he died. He was buried. He was raised from the dead. And several weeks, six weeks later or so, he ascended to the Father. But Jesus said something very interesting in John chapter 14. He's talking to his disciples and applies to us as well. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. And he says that you know, you, essentially this is how he says it, you know him, he is with you, and he will be in you. So here's the way it goes. God with us, this amazing miracle of God being with us. Well, he was with us by means of the incarnation. Now he is with us by being in us by means of the new birth. If you've received Christ, you've been born again by the Spirit of God. And now God lives in you by his Spirit, the one who created all things. All things created by him, for him, through him. All things hold together. That God lives inside uh, of you. So he's there and he's accompanying you and he's inside of you and he's right there. And if, if uh, I'll tell you, um, if God's with you, you don't have to f be afraid of anything. If God's with you, you could face anything. If God's with you, you don't have to be concerned about the future because he has it. Turn with me in your Bibles to Isaiah 41.10. We'll look at some Old Testament text here. What we want to see a little bit more, what I want to do for you a little bit more, is I want to increase theme for God and understanding of God because it's real important is God who is with you because all the promises depend on the, the character and also the power and ability and capacity of that God. So this is Isaiah 41, verse 10. You could read the whole chapter, the chapter before it. Actually, you can go 40 through 48. I mean, it's just a broad sweep. Uh, it tells you all kinds of things about God. But here's 41 for our purposes this morning. It says this, verse 10. It says, fear not. This is God speaking through the prophet. Fear not. So you don't have to fear God's with you. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. God is your God. God is with you. Fear not, I will strengthen you. Fear not, I will help you. Fear not, I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Some people will take this and look at it. These are five different pillars of reasons not to fear. I think they're probably right there. But I also think a, a concurrent truth is this. The fact that God's with me tells me that God will strengthen me, God will help me, God will uphold me with his righteous right hand. And the fact that he's with me is evidence and indicative of the fact that he's my God. 
that I belong to him. Now, these are amazing promises because he says, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you. I'm going to uphold you. I am your God. And you know, you look at that. Don't be afraid. Don't, whatever you face in life, you don't have to be, a fear, be afraid because I'm with you. But what this whole thing is dependent on is who God really is. Now, I've already given you a glimpse from John 1, and that should have been really enough, but we're going to do a little bit more. See, the whole thing's dependent on who God is. Because if this is just some enfeebled God imposter, it, it holds no water. If somebody says to you on a human level, says, look, I'm going to take care of you the rest of my lo- your life. I'm going to protect you, watch out for you, provide for you. And this person's got no money, no resource, no power, no influence. He can make all the promises he wants. And it's not going to hold. you understand the reasoning? All right, so what's critical is you understand who this God is. So we're going to go all the way back to Isaiah 40. And we'll, we'll do this. Verse 10, it said, this is God speaking through the prophet talking about, actually revealing himself. It says, Behold, the Lord God comes with might. His arm rules before him. Verse 11, it says, He will tend his flock. That's you and me if you've believed. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arm. Boy, you can blow this whole thing up. It says he will tend his flock like a shepherd. What does a shepherd do? Shepherd takes care of. Shepherd takes, hey, the shepherd takes the flock to where they can get the food so it can flourish. The shepherd takes the flock where he can get the water. The shepherd looks out for the flock. The shepherd protects the flock. The shepherd disciplines the flock. The shepherd, when, the, when a member of the flock is hurting, the shepherd personally gets involved and takes care of that sheep. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom. You know, we read this, and I know I do. I'm guilty of it. I'm sure you are. This is very, very personal language. This is God saying, this is how I am with you. And I'll gently lead those who are with young. Then he goes on. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand? You know what God's talking about there? This is God. When he's talking about the waters in the hollow of his hand, he's talking about oceans. This is, this is what it's like to him. Marked off the heavens with a span, enclosed the dust of the earth in a measure, weighed the mountains in scales, the hills in bounds. Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him counsel? And it goes on and on. Basically, it says, who has ever counseled God? Who is it ever that's given God advice? You know why nobody counsels God and nobody gives God advice? Because God doesn't need any. God's the standard of what good counsel is. God's the standard of what justice is. God's the standard of what righteousness is. God's the standard of what wise judgment is. God is the standard of everything that's good and holy and righteous and all of it. God's the standard of all wisdom. Then he says in verse 15, he says, you want to know what God is like? You see, there's a God that made promises that he's there for you. He's there for you. He's there for you. You want to know what God? This is God. Behold, the nations are like a drop from the bucket. In other words, compared to God, all the nations, I mean, go through them, whatever, former Soviet Union, China, the Korea, let's just go through the whole thing. You can go through all the continents. He says, you know what they're like? They're like a drop from the bucket. You know all the, the big, big, powerful rulers? They're nothing to me. I rule over rulers. He says that later on and goes on Verse 18, to whom then will you liken God, or what likeness compare with him? An idol? And then he goes through. In fact, repeatedly in the prophets, I, I, uh, probably three, four, five times in Isaiah, uh, essentially what God does is he says to the people, you know, I'll do my language, okay? If I were prophesying. He says, what are you guys, crazy? I'm God. I created everything. I've sustained you. The only reason you're alive is because of me. The only reason you get another breath is because of me. I I, I own everything. Everything belongs to me. I answer to no one, and yet you don't worship me. Instead, you make these little wooden monuments, or you make these little stone monuments, or you you, uh, serve this God, or you serve that God. They're all fake. None of them can hear. None of them can help you. None of them see what you're going through. None of them have capacity or ability. And you'll say, well, Pastor, I don't have any wooden deity out in my backyard. Well, thank God for that. But the, the fact of the matter is, man, we're all pursuing, all of us struggle. Calvin said that the human heart is an idle factory. In other words, we're always producing these kind of new things that we give our allegiance to. I mean, some of us, our allegiance is to the government and whatever it can provide. And I'm saying you shouldn't have an allegiance to the government, but the government's not God. 
Your pre- Sometimes our job is God. Our career is, jo- uh, uh, is God. A certain title is God. A certain person is God. We have all kinds of false gods all over the place. God's speaking to you today. He said, he'd, say, he'd say what he said in 1 John. Actually, John said, little children, keep yourself away from idols. If you ever read through 1 John, it's interesting. He says virtually nothing about idols. And then the very last verse in this letter he writes, it's like, you know what? Bottom line, keep yourself away from idols. There's one true God. And that's what he goes through here in Isaiah. He said, here's the true God. This is who you are. Verse 21, or who he is. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Have you not heard? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. Who's this? God. Its inhabitants are like grasshoppers. Think of all the greatest rulers. Even today, think of all the most powerful people that you can think about that live on planet earth. (laughs) These guys, they're like grasshoppers. Like grasshoppers. Who stretches out the heavens like a curtain, spread them like a tented dwelling. Who brings princes to nothing. All the rulers. Ah, Putin, over in former Soviet Union, he brings princes to nothing. Do you know? I mean, we get phased by him. We get phased by the knucklehead in North Korea. God doesn't get phased by any of those things. It's like not even a blip on his radar screen. Who brings princes to nothing? Makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness? Scarcely are they planted, scarcely stones, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth. When he blows on them and they wither, for the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me? You say, Pastor George, where are you going? Well, I'm going, I'm saying, God is with us. And you've got to know something about the God that is with us. The God who is with us is the one that's created everything. The God that's with us is the one that holds all things together. The God who is with us says the nations are nothing when compared to me. The God who is with us says the rulers are nothing when they're compared to me. The God who is with us says, you guys, you're crazy for following these idols. I'm far superior to any of them. Scarcely are they plenty. He goes through this. Verse 25, to whom then will you compare me that I should be like him, says the Holy One. And so what does this mean? What's that language mean? There's nobody that compares to me. I mean, come on. No one that compares to God. Then lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. What he's looking out on is the stars. And this was an interesting dynamic. I did it one time before, but I did it afresh just yesterday. He's looking at the stars. It says, who brings out their hosts by number, calling them all by name. So in other words, I mean, you go out here, you know, if you've got a nice night and a starry night, and you look at all the stars that are all over the place, and you're saying, well, God knows all those stars. He's the one that created them all, and he calls them all by name. Okay, fine. You know what? I, I, look, I went to this science site. Just find out how many stars they estimate? Well, first of all, the science site said there's a pr- approximately an estimated 10 trillion galaxies in the universe. Then it said there is an estimated one septillion stars. And they said this is probably, probably very, very underestimated in all those galaxies. I mean, uh, Charles Moore was here today and he knew what a septillion was. I mean, I'm fairly well educated. I didn't have a clue what a septillion was. It was a one followed by 24 zeros. But that that, that, that blows your mind. But how about this? You know, I got four kids. I can't keep their names straight. He knows all their names. You know, this is, uh, you know, whatever it is. This is star, you know, I don't even know how it works. You know, 982 trillion, 783 billion, 692 million, 722,000. That's that star and it's named whatever it is. Are you kidding me? I'm like, oh, wait, this is my firstborn. Here's my next one. This, well, what God's doing with, with some pretty elaborate language is letting you know, look, Nobody thinks like me. Nobody knows like me. Nobody's as strong as me. Nobody's as powerful as me. He's going through all of that, and he's doing it for a reason. The scripture says, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he's strong in power, not one is missing. So they don't know what that means. So we got a septillion. Again, coming back to my kids. When when they were young, we go down the shore. Shore was always interesting for me when my kids were young because it's supposed to be a fun time, but I always had to plant myself right right by the water, and I'm, like, watching them. And I'm counting. It's only four, right? One, two, three. And I'd be like, okay, one, two, three, four. 
And then like 30 seconds later, one, two, three, four. Well, you know, I'm making sure none of my four are missing. <laughs> this is like we got a septillion stars. And not one's missing. And he's not even worried about it because he just kind of like knows everything all at the same time. Wow. So he says all this stuff, right? And in verse 27, why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right hand is disregarded by God? So he says all that. He says, look, th this is me. So why are you, you know, why, why, why are you, Joe, or Omar, or, or Ron, or Carmen, wh why are you saying, God, don't you know what's going on in my life? Don't you see? Don't you hear? Aren't you? And God's saying, I got a septillion stars. And it doesn't even, it's not even a second thought for me. Wow, why do you say this? Because you know what? Every single person, every single person in here has said something like that. Where are you, God? Doesn't feel like God cares. Doesn't feel like God knows. And then, you know, the way the rest of the text goes, it says, have you not heard or have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God. He's like reiterating it for him. The creator of the ends of the earth. Remember, this is a God, creator of the ends of the earth. He doesn't faint or grow weary. He doesn't get tired like you get tired. His understanding is unsearchable. You know, when Pastor Jonathan was talking today and kind of leading us in some additional worship and adoration of God, and I was sta I've been standing a lot in the early service, and I was standing a lot in the second service, and, and I'm 60 years old, my joints are wearing out, and they're, my shoulders hurting, my knees hurting. So I sat down, and he says right after that, how can you sit down? I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, you see, God, he doesn't faint or grow weary. I was like, <laughs> you had like ideal timing. It was like, I'm like, ah. Oh. <laughs> I should have I lacked on this next one. He gives power to the faint. Yes. To him who has no might, he increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They'll mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Verse 41, 10, fear not. For guess what? I'm with you. Who's with you? The God that was just described himself in 40 and 41. I'm with you. I'm your God. I'll strengthen you. I'll help you. I'll uphold you with my righteous right hand. One of the greatest promises, in my view, actually, I've thought about this for a long time, could be wrong, obviously, but I think the greatest promise in all the Bible is this. God is with you. God's with you. See, the fact that God's with you, you don't have to be afraid anymore. You just simply don't. There's a whole lot of stuff you can fear in life. There's no shortage of things to be afraid of in life. But God says, if I'm with you, you don't have to fear anymore. I'm with you, and I'll help you, and I'll uphold you. You know what? The Scripture is replete with exhortations in one way or another not to worry and not to be anxious. You know why? Because people tend to be wor worry and be anxious, and because there's a whole lot of reasons to be. God is with you. You don't have to be anxious anymore. God is with you. Guess what? You're never going to be alone. How about that? I mean, Timmy was kind of explaining some things today. That doesn't mean you won't sometimes feel alone. The fact of the matter is, is you're never alone. Because God is with you. You don't have to worry and agonize over what's the doctor going to say. God's got it all under control. You don't have to worry and agonize. I think my, my, my company's going to go out of business. God's got that all under control. That doesn't catch him beat by surprise. He's not fully occupied with his septillion stars. He can do everything else that has to be done. And he knows about every company and every corporation and every doctor and every test and every individual and every potential sickness and every potential cure. And he knows all of it. So God is with you. But here's the thing. Sometimes we, we forget. One of the great, I'll tell you, if you want to live a strong Christian life, one of the things you've got to learn to do is preach to yourself. You know, I'm walking, I was walking into church this morning. And I did what I used. Man, I don't know if you do this. I'm walking. I come right around the corner, and I'm preaching to myself. So then I'm embarrassed because the person has seen me. I say, hey, look, I'm just preaching to myself. And then they say nice things like, oh, well, that's great. And I'm sure they're walking away thinking, man, this pastor's a lunatic. He's preaching to himself. But you know what? The fact of the matter is you've got to remind yourself, and you've got to preach to yourself. You've got you to preach the gospel to yourself, and you've got to just preach stuff to yourself. You've got to say, you know what? God's for me. He's not against me. God is with me. I don't have to be afraid. And you remind yourself. And you know what? It's not just even preaching the promises of God to yourself because you can preach them to yourself, but you've got to believe them. You want to live success? You've got to have faith in the promises of God. 
Well, let's be realistic. Sometimes you're just wrung out and you've been, you've been through it and you can't even preach to yourself. You can't even remind yourself. And you certainly can't. You're having a hard time believing because you can't even preach it to yourself. You know what you got to do then? That's why you got to be in community. That's why the Christian life isn't meant to be lived alone. you got to be able to call up a friend who's going to preach it to you. you got to be able to call up a friend. Even if you call them up and say, remind me of some of the promises of God. And you, remind, and, and you let that friend, that friend tell you, look, this is, this is God. I know you're going through. What you're going through now, I, I can't imagine. But this is what I know about God. And God loves you. And God cares for you. And God is with you. And God is in you. And God will sustain you. And God will keep you. And God will bring you through. And God will never leave you. And God will make you whole. And you know what's a great ministry for all of you have? That's what you do for one another. That's what you do for one another. So... Um, we're going to take just a few minutes here because I know, you know, we're, we're kind of going a little bit later. And I just want to urge you to break into some prayer groups and just, uh, you got any kind of needs, share them with one another. But remind one another about God. You can remind in prayer. I mean, somebody pray boldly. It's God, thank you that you're with me. Thank you that you provide. You know, there's somebody in our group here that needs some provision now. Thank you for that. There's somebody in our group now that needs healing. Thank you for that. There's somebody that's really suffering some relational break. They need healing there. So get in groups, if you wouldn't mind, and just pray together and pray the promises of God and believe the promises of God. He is with you. Amen.